This is In Character. I'm your host, Gerard Robinson, Vice President for Education at the Advanced Studies in Culture Foundation. Hello, everyone. This is Gerard Robinson. I'm the Vice President for Education at the Advanced Studies and Culture Foundation, located in beautiful Charlottesville, Virginia. But of course, everyone who's on the call with me right now is not from Charlottesville, Virginia. As you know, every month, at least one time a month, I have an opportunity to speak to educators, social entrepreneurs, professors, and others uh, in the field of K-12 and higher education. Today, I'm particularly excited to talk to educators to who have a, a, a let's say a lifelong engagement in literacy, uh, something that is personally and professionally of interest to me, and I'll tell you why uh, toward the end. But really looking forward to the conversation today. As you know, literacy is the foundation for our democracy, the ability to be able to read, to comprehend across space, not just the literature itself, but also mathematics and science. But you didn't come here to listen to me. You can't listen to the experts. So with that, I want to welcome all of you to In Character. And what I do, uh, as I do with every group, is just ask one question. Um, it is, you know, what attracted you to the field of education? So if you can just give me your name, uh, where you work, and state, and then answer that question, and we'll go. So let me see. I'll start with uh, Dorita, who is closest to me in the, in the camera. All right. Hello, everyone. I am Dr. Doretha Allen. I am a innovation coordinator in Dallas ISD in Texas. And what drew me to um, the profession, I think, were uh, my first teachers, who were my parents. Um, they were both high school graduates. I'm a first gen um, college student, but my parents were always reading, whether it was the newspaper, which we got religiously, uh, Time Magazine, Nat Geo, uh, they showed us the world and they modeled those behaviors every day. Good to hear that. We should talk uh, shop about uh, Dallas. My stepdad's from Marshall, Texas. Um, oh, I went to college in Marshall, Texas. Let me see, Wiley College? Absolutely. All right, I'm an HU grad, HBC. You grad as well, so always good. And in fact, I was on your campus a couple of years ago because you're doing great work in criminal justice reform. Yes. Good to hear that. So, Laura, let me kick it over to you, the great state of Wyoming. Well, my name is Dr. Laura Drake, and I am a Wyoming native of 55 years. And so when we're talking about cultural literacy, uh, it's just a really fun topic for me to participate in. I have been an educator for 32 years. Um, I just retired. I hope to continue um, in the education field at a collegiate level. And I'm doing some work with our uh, Department of Education um, peer review teams. I chose to be a, a teacher because I had a phenomenal high school agricultural education teacher. And he was one of those teachers that it didn't matter really who you were. He looked for your hidden talents and he pushed you and he believed in you and he never really saw limits. All he saw were the possibilities in each of us. And as a result of that, um, I actually started my collegiate uh, career in agriculture education and then later switched. Thank you. Are you a native of Wyoming as well? Am I a native? Were you born there? Yes, I was born in central Wyoming and I now live in Cheyenne. Okay, great. So, Tekaru, let's, let's go to you. Awesome. Hi, everyone. My name is Tekaru Nagayoshi. I also go by TK. I'm the 2020 Massachusetts Teacher of the Year and a former high school English and research teacher. Uh, I'm actually taking a break from the classroom and currently work at Panorama Education as their director of community events. Um, a pretty big shift and still kind of learning and unlearning many of the things that I have experienced in the classroom as I transition outside of it. Um, but as far as what drew me into the classroom, uh, similar to what a lot of other panelists have said, really great educators. Uh, I had a period of living in Japan from when I was nine to 14. And I struggled a lot as a Japanese language learner. And hopefully I can elaborate a little bit more uh, later on as we have this discussion. Uh, but it wasn't until I moved to the States 
where I had these great teachers, like my AP history teacher, my literature teacher, right, who gave me a voice and a way to express myself in a literacy context that spoke to me, uh, and then put me on that right path towards looking at school as something where I could fit in. Uh, and so those are the reasons why uh, I think I was always drawn to the profession of teaching. So at one point in Japan, now you're in Massachusetts. Um, when you came back to the, when you came to the States, what state or states were you going to school in? I'm all over the place. So uh, born and raised in New Jersey, uh, went okay. to school in New York, uh, then also in Japan. Uh, I taught at Massachusetts and I currently live in Rhode Island. So a little bit of the mix of all uh -huh. of the states. Yep. I have a, a similar point uh, to, to a point my friends would say, you know, where's Waldo? Where's Gerard? Because I've lived in a number of places. We well, definitely want you to talk more about uh, your story as a uh, English language learner in Japan. Part of the story we often don't get a chance to hear. Last but not least, we have our friend from New Hampshire. Hi, I'm Angie Miller. I'm a middle and high school English history uh, teacher and a librarian. And um, like uh, somebody earlier said, I was a first gen college student. I grew up in pretty significant poverty. Um, I was pregnant at the age of 17 and uh, I lived in public housing and often food stamps. And, um, and I went back to school and my baby girl went to kindergarten. And um, I think when I look at sort of my childhood and early young adult years, I could easily be a statistic. And education was really sort of what saved me and literacy. And so um, when I returned to school as an educator, I really worked hard for, um, those who were disenfranchised or, you know, were also growing up in poverty or similar circumstances. Um, but that has sort of been my mission and drive. So first of all, thanks for opening up your personal story. Uh, it means a lot to uh, all of us, as well as those who are going to watch and listen to this. Are you from New Hampshire? Or I am, you? yes. Okay. Yeah. All right. It's and fun. it's beautiful here right now. It's foliage and the trees are on fire. Good stuff. And I can tell, for, I never would have imagined you were a librarian, but maybe the books behind you, maybe a little, a little giveaway. <laughs> <laughs> so let me do a, a dive into exactly what is a literacy um, expert or literacy teacher. The reason I ask is because when we say math, yep, got it. We say science, got it. For example, you mentioned you teach English and others. But we hear literacy, there are a lot of things that come to people's mind. Explain, we'll start off with you, um, Duitha. What exactly in the realm of literacy are you involved in? What do you do? What keeps you excited? So when I think literacy, when, when I talk to people and they say, well, what did you do? And I say, well, I was a, a literacy meta coach. Well, what, what is that? Is that just reading? And I say, well, no, yep. it's, it's not. Yep. It's, um, it's reading and it's writing and it's thinking um, all the time. That's that's the lane that that I lived in um, doing doing that work. So I was always um, studying the craft, and I was always um, really still watching kids when I was on campuses working with the literacy coaches I supported. Because whatever the kids struggle with. I feel like that's what teachers need to know about. Mm -hmm. And that's what coaches needed to know about. So um, it was very, very often when a teacher would say, hey, um, Miss Allen, Dr. Allen, I'm really, my kids are really struggling with this. I'm having a hard time getting it. And I say, oh, well, have you thought about using this text, this picture book to uh, illustrate how to do it with a think aloud? Or have you thought about having them write this? Or have you modeled? Um, and they say, no, you know, can you can you show me? And I was like, yeah, how much time do we have? You Let's do it right now. And I would take my jacket off, take my sweater off and jump in because it's always that um, connection to me with literacy, even if it's just a comprehension skill, and I say just a comprehension skill, mm -hmm. but everybody on this call knows that um, that's heavy lifting. I always included um, writing because I felt that writing sealed the deal. It always sealed the deal for me. And see, it, what you opened up with is 
exactly what most of us think. Oh, it's just reading. It's just it's nothing else. Or if we talk about, for example, we take, if we say someone is in, this gets to uh, Laura's point about agriculture, we somehow think it's all hand, no head. Um, because it's vocational, when in fact they're all connected. And Laura, I saw your head nod a lot of times. Same question for you. Feel free to jump in. Well, I was going back to what TK said, and you know, he said a voice. When you talk about what literacy is, he said um, it's a voice. Uh, when you talk about what literacy is, he said it, it's a voice in a literary context. And I have, when you ask us this question, I was thinking about. Um, Literacy uses, we use it in a literacy context, but it's really and truly thinking. And to mm -hmm. me, literacy um, opens the door for students, not only to learn how to read and to write, to be successful in a career because they can do those things, but to be able to go out into the world and think critically after being exposed to literature, after having discussions around good literature, um, we start teaching our kids about windows and mirrors. You know, when they're uh, matched with literature that teaches them more about themselves, you're talking about a mirror. And, and they can't really fully understand themselves until they t learn about the rest of the world in kind of that global way. So then you're talking about the window and kids can't truly understand the world they live in if they don't have those windows. And I think that literacy is really and truly a place for good critical thinking. It's for reflection. And so it goes a step further from what Doretha said and gets into that thinking piece for students. And I teach fifth grade or taught, I'm retired now, but um, even last year, and the one thing that I've learned about even a 10 or 11 year old is they can think very critically and use those thinking skills to help them maneuver the new world that they live in. Yeah, 30 years ago, uh, last month, I began my career in education uh, in Los Angeles as a fifth grade school teacher. And I was in, uh, in fact, in a conversation with one of my fifth grade students uh, two days ago. So fifth grade is a good point. And, and trust me, they think more clearly than we sometimes think they do. So there's two people hit on thinking. TK, same question for you and dive in and take it where you want to. Yeah, I mean, cosign everything that Dorothy and, 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 and Laura have said, uh, it's your ability to read and write. But I think in schools, it's operationalized in this really narrow and highly contextualized way, right? Mm -hmm. As standard English language reading and writing in an academic context. More problematically, I would argue that it's all the crap that ELA teachers do, right? In terms of what, people tend to think of it. And I feel like that way of approaching literacy does such a disservice to the broad concept of it, right? Because it can be sliced and thought of in so many different ways. Coding is its own type of literacy. Scanning a sheet of music is its own type of literacy. Reading a pie chart is a type of literacy. Following directions on a cookbook is a type of literacy. And I'd also argue that making your, your, your own TikTok video is its own type of literacy. Something that if we were tested on as adults, we'd all probably fail. Uh, and all of those examples are literacy examples because they require an ability to grasp the linguistic patterns, the jargon, the unique social norms and conventions that are inherent in the spaces where we practice that form of discourse. Um, so I have a really good pandemic related example, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, during the 2020 school shutdown, there was like this assumption that our kids are gonna do so great with virtual learning and I teach high school, right? Uh, and the, the notion was they're digital natives, right? Uh, and I felt that way too, until a ninth grader asked me, how do I make the box smaller? And she was asking me how to minimize her browser window. Uh, in other words, she didn't have the digital literacy skills, at least the, the Microsoft Word using computer context that we adults think of. Yeah. But if we were to give her a smartphone, she'd navigate her customization preferences on all her social media apps without any issue. But that's a separate genre of literacy, right? Um, and so, oh, I just really want to share this with you. There's this really great Wired article mm -hmm. about college kids and how they don't name and collate their digital documents and folders anymore. Um, and whereas it's tempting for us older generations to look down at that as a poor organizational skill, 
a mm. lot of the reason why you know younger students are thinking and processing in this way is because if you look at our current digital ecosystem, everything is on the cloud, right? It can be pulled up through a quick search. And so there's not as much of a functional need for the specific contextual skills that we might have grown up with. Uh, and oddly enough, they're actually really resourceful at pulling out files on command, even if their desktop might look like uh, a complete chaotic mess. Uh, and so I think what's important for us adults to think about uh, especially when it comes to literacy skills and these different types of skills that are emerging in a digital context, is rather than to disparage the literacy skills our children supposedly lack, we should be improving right, and imploring on our own selves about what they actually bring to the table and what they'll need to succeed moving forward. Uh, and just because, for instance, you grew up with reading and writing in cursive, it doesn't always mean that our kids have to either. Good point. Our last but not least, what do you think? So for me, literacy has always been about identity. Um, what we read, what we write is who we are. And so as a literacy teacher, I've always tried to use that for students. I loved um, the analogy of windows and mirrors. That was, I really like that. Um, because it is, it's about who am I and then where do I fit into this world, which means you have to understand that world itself. Um, but I also think it's very dangerous when we start saying, this is what you will read, this is what you will write, that kids start to lose sight of, of who they are. So finding that balance. Um, but that has always driven my basic philosophy as a teacher and as a librarian is what you read, what you write is who you are. So here's a question. What you do in terms of your craft, I want to borrow Doritha's uh, term, how much of that did you get through um, School of Education or where you went to school? How much of that you learned uh, on the job? How much of that is gut combination? I won't call anybody, just jump in as, as you'd like. You know, of course, I went to school, college a long time ago. But to be quite honest, my shift in thinking about what literacy for students should look like has really only occurred in the past five or six years okay. about how to use literature in the way that um, we're discussing to help kids reflect and learn more about themselves um, and really to learn more about being a global citizen. And I think that we want to be able to find and use good literacy to teach kids about when people may not always agree on things, when we come at all these different perspectives and to use literature to teach that um, and to have those discussions with kids and, and being mindful that we're not trying to influence their views on things per se or to um, mm -hmm. impress our values upon them, but to let them think about things in a multitude of ways. And I think that, um, and, I, and I can't really tell you, Gerard, what the shift was for me, but that we needed to use literature in a much deeper way than what we had been using it in the past. And, and part of that's the age of the kids probably that I'm teaching, but I believe even our littles can think very critically about what they're reading and, and do that kind of thinking. Thank you. I, I really wanna answer that question. Um, you're probably like a social emotional lens. Uh, and one thing that they didn't really tell us when I was learning, right? Uh, and going to school being an English teacher is just how literacy and, and the skills inherent in literacy is such a social emotional concept. Uh, and, I, I, and I mentioned how I lived in Nagoya, Japan, right? From the ages of nine to 14. Uh, and because of the language barrier, I academically struggled like a lot. Uh, in middle school, we'd have these, these class academic ranks. It's a terrible practice, I know. Uh, but I remember how in the seventh grade, uh, second quarter, I was ranked 150 out of 165. And that's really demoralizing, right? Uh, and as an adult in education, I can better contextualize why I academically struggled so much. It was because I was a Japanese language learner. Uh, and sure, yes, I spoke Japanese at home with my parents, but I was a heritage speaker, uh, someone who picked up the bits and pieces through conversation. And I didn't really have fluency over the formal honorific Japanese speech, the written language, the grammar and vocabulary of the academic language that we use in school. Uh, so needless to say, when it came to schooling, 
uh, which tends to operationalize literacy in those latter ways that I just mentioned, it was a big challenge for me. Like I remember my ears feeling hot and red when I was asked to read a passage and I had to stumble over every other kanji character that I was trying to read through. I remember the pain of reading, rereading the same sentence over and over and not getting it and eventually giving up. And I also remember that, you know, by the time I found out that my class rank was 150 out of 165, I internalized that school wasn't for me. Um, and so I didn't really care. And, and so I think when we discuss literacy, we always have to understand that sort of social emotional context of where the kids are at. Uh, and then for right, a student who was like me about their background, uh, about the cultural uh, heritage that they bring in and why some of the dis, uh, you know, struggles right, <laughs> that might be inherent in, 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 their, in their journey might look like. Uh, and, and, and that experience, at least for me, was sort of formative in helping me help out English language learners and frankly, all learners, because we're all developing writers, we're all developing speakers. That's something that I said to my students all the time. Uh, and trying to model that concept, right? Uh, and giving them that patience and grace is I think an important uh, part of the piece. Thank you. So I have um, three, three standout moments to respond to the question. And I'm gonna try to hit them in this logical sequential order as best I can. So I, I went to school um, to be a teacher, to be an elementary school teacher. And as soon as I finished, I was in a grad program in CNI and then I was teaching and then I was back in grad school and, and I continued teaching and then I, I finished my doctorate. So I have been in school um, around teaching for a long, a long time. Um, but it wasn't in those places where I actually learned about literacy, like the, the real deal, boots on the ground, when you get in the room and those kids are looking at you and they're struggling what you do. I I, I didn't I didn't get that from um the on high, on, on high, the ivory tower. I didn't get it. In, tw in 2003, um, I joined the Reading Academy. I became a laureate of the Reading Academy, which is a, well, at that time, it was a partnership between um, a local university, University of Texas at Arlington and Dallas ISD. And it was a semester, well, a year long uh, course and you went one night a week, but it was in the schools. And a master reading teacher who worked for the district um, taught a group of teachers about reading. And we went through books and we learned uh, the power of retelling and we practiced how to read and how to um, do activities and how you plan questions. I mean, just really intensive instruction on that. And I think it was my uh, third or fourth year teaching and that changed me as a teacher. Before then I would read books, do, 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 close it and keep going. But I didn't really um, do all of the things that I was learning. So uh, fast forward a couple of years, there was a um, there's a part another partnership with the Dallas Institute of Humanities and Culture, which is a uh, nonprofit, and it's a partnership with the University of Dallas. And mm -hmm. teachers uh, apply, and you get in, and you go for at that time it was three weeks in the summer, uh, all day, eight to four thirty, and you read uh, a ton of books. I mean they you went to orientation and they gave you a canvas bag full of books from around the globe. So there was the tragic summer uh, and then it was the epic summer. And, and I'm reading this stuff and you're reading so much you can't remember. You can't, you can't remember what you read. And then you go to class every day and you start the day with lecture. That summer really put me in this uncomfortable learner seat. And every day I kept questioning, I don't know why I keep coming back here because what they're talking about, that is not what I saw in Ashless. That is not what I saw in Prometheus Bam. Uh, I just want him to shut up while he was getting, um, you know, tied to the rock, you know. So my perspective was 
very different from theirs, but it put me back in the learner's seat. And that did a lot for me because in those two summers I went, I transitioned grades from third grade to fifth grade. And what that summer taught me is that um, novels, reading to my children, with my children, it teaches the human condition. It teaches empathy. And that's something that I had not learned in all of my formal schooling, okay? So then I, I fast forward again a couple of years and I didn't mention this at the beginning um, just because I failed to mention it, but I am a National Board Certified Teacher in Literacy. And the standards of the National Board Certified Teachers for Literacy talk about uh, what the accomplished teacher knows, what the accomplished teacher does, what the accomplished teacher demonstrates. In being current and up on um, novels to show the human condition, to make those connections to a, uh, so a student can make a text-to-text -text connection, a text-to-self, um, a text-to-world connection. It's all through literacy. So in those three um, definite experiences, that is what really, really, really um, made me up my literacy game. Uh, not, unfortunately, not the formal education that I, I've acquired, mm -hmm. but those um, outside partnerships with organizations that, that I think are still very, very important. Thank you. Yeah, for me, um... I mean, formal education was my university program was excellent and I had amazing educators who were really steeped in the Nancy Atwell theory. Um, but I don't, I think what def, the defining moment or experience for me as a literacy teacher was the difference between watching my daughter learn how to read and love to read and my son learning how to read and hating to read. And, um, and I would say as my son grew older, he changed me as a teacher. Um, and it, and that was when I really started to understand that connection between literacy and identity and not one size fits all. And that if you don't have passion, it's very hard to grow skill. If you have somebody who's turned off or convinced that they aren't good at it. I'm sure at some point, oh, Laura, you want to say something? Okay. At some point when you've worked with um, parents, uh, some of them may have said, listen, my child's just having a tough time with comprehension or even reading. How have you worked with parents, some of them who, who may also have had challenges with literacy themselves? How do you work with them to A, let them know that, yes, we can, we'll get your child where uh, he or she needs to be, but also to give them comfort and assurity when we know that, you know, 30 plus million people in the United States who are adults uh, have challenged reading above eighth grade level. That's just an open question whoever wants to jump in. You know, I kind of want to uh, jump in where uh, Angie left off mm -hmm. when, when she was talking about her daughter's uh, love and then her son's disdain. Um, it was about my second or third year teaching that I really had a mental shift and how I uh, approached my boys with reading. Hmm. Um, I, I had a epiphany that they are all smart, but they are not like me. <laughs> so I literally said, every boy I see, I'm looking at them like they are Patrick. And Patrick is my little brother who uh, had all young white female teachers and um, always scored in the, in the 90-plus percentile of tests, but was a classic C student. Cla just so my folks wouldn't kill him. Classic C students. Um, and I think about um, the kids that I had, the, the boys, after I had gotten hip to teaching the human condition through novels. And I would read novels about boys who are finding their way. And I had kids who were uh, virtually non-readers, 
uh, 12 when they came to fifth grade. So, you know, that's over age, 11 and 12 when they came to fifth grade. So over age boys uh, getting hooked on listening and then they could follow the comprehension uh, of those those novels. And so when I would encounter their parents and I tried to as, as often as I could to tell them how great their kid was doing. You know, they're, they are on their way. No, they're not there yet, but they're on their way. Ask them about such and such. We've been reading this. Ask them to read this to you. We've been reading this. So I stoked that uh, relationship with uh, the good news because I wanted, you know, I always say we're on team David. <laughs> We're on team. We're on the same side. We're on the same side. And um, whatever we were doing in class, I would say, hey, you know what? This weekend, make sure you read this to your mama. I want you to knock her socks off, you know, because I told her we were going to do such and such. And I really um, built the relationship between um, and, and that and that had served me well. So making those uh, calls that were positive. Now, that's not to say that. Um, there weren't negative calls, but if I struck out first with the positive and made it academic, then that went a long way uh, because most of my kids who struggled with their reading uh, in years past, they had been the um, behavior, the behavior um, superstars, quote unquote, the, the high flyers, the frequent flyers to the office. You guys know what I'm talking about. Those are usually the ones who struggle academically because they can't, they act out because they don't get it. So that's their way of getting um, the attention that they, they need. I think if you have ever talked to a kid about, you know, no matter what the age about a movie or a show that they liked and they give you like the blow by blow detail um, until your eyes glaze over, um, kids will do that about books that they're passionate about as well. And so what I've found is if you can instill a love of reading or writing in a child, the parent communication becomes very positive because the parents start hearing about the book they were reading with me or the book they were reading on their own or the writing piece that they were very proud of. And so it, it becomes a, a nice bridge so that we all are on the same team. Yeah. And I think, too, that you have to, and I'm thinking of your sons, because um, I raised two boys. One was an avid reader. One wouldn't read for anything. Um, but you have to think a little bit outside of the reading box that we often put ourselves into and really seek and dig deeply with parents into what are the kids' interests. Maybe their interests are building models. And if they're building models, then let them read the instructions you know, and not think traditionally when we're trying to help our kids, give them a, a multiple multitude of ways to access reading. Um, for instance, one year I had this little boy, the only thing he would read, and this was a third grader, Jaretha, the only thing he would read was geog geology books. And I'm like, I don't even know if he knows half the words. I don't mm -hmm. even know it's all he would read. And he had some other special needs. So I let him read it. He'd read them every day. He was totally into it. And every time we took a test for reading progress, he always went up. And so I think sometimes we have to let go a little bit too to help these struggling readers to find that thing that's going to work for them. Yeah, I, I love everything that I heard, you know, choosing something that is authentically interesting to the students. Uh, reframing, right, their their skill deficit in an asset-based way um, is, is another theme that I heard a lot of the, the panelists say. Um, also, I feel like inherent in some of the ways that we've been discussing this is like, it's important for us to acknowledge that how our school, you know, implements literacy, imposes literacy is narrow and in some cases stigmatizing to students, right? It's no secret that a lot of the culture, right, inherent uh, in our schools, from the pedagogy to curriculum to how classes are built are based off of white Eurocentric ideals. And so when it comes to literacy, at least for me, right, it's also important to differentiate that literacy in school is different for literacy in other contexts, right, to Laura's point. Uh, so I had a student, uh, my, my first year of teaching, I remember, uh, and she really struggled with academic writing and academic literacy. But when it came to the raps that she'd write between her classes, there was a flow and a rhythm, 
right, to her writing and performance that I would argue rival Shakespeare. Uh, and so when I think of asset-based ways of, of looking at our students and talking about them to, uh, you know, to their parents, why don't we celebrate, you know, language in all its form, their literacy in all its form. Uh, and I think part of that, as I've mentioned, is, is, is recognizing the critique that how we conceptualize literacy currently uh, is a very narrow academic Eurocentric model. Uh, and just because a student might be struggling in that way, doesn't mean that they're dumb, doesn't mean that they're lazy, right? Uh, it just means that we have to find those other venues to get them there. I had a chance to uh, see Hamilton when it came on Disney for my wife. I had actually paid for, uh, paid for her to go see it in New York. The number of parents who said they would never have gotten interested in this if it wasn't for the delivery that made it interesting. And all of you have touched on this at a point. Here's a question about policy and politics. And so I've had a chance to work with departments of ed. How do we balance making sure students are literate? I'll let you define how that is, but we also can somehow figure out how literate they are based upon tests. I don't test on everything, but they are something. How do we balance that debate that's going on right now between literacy and assessment? Because when I talk to people at the collegiate level, they say, Gerard, I hear what you're saying. People are coming out of school, high school, no, college and career ready, and they're spending one, three, two, three semesters in remediation courses. Mm -hmm. How do we balance that? Um, I'll jump in quickly because I'm not a giant fan of standardized testing. Yeah. So for eight years, or I'm sorry, for 12 years, I taught grades six, seven, and eight. So I worked in a rural school and I had the luxury of um, seeing the same hundred students every day for three years in a row. And um, when I got them, so we tested in fifth grade and eighth grade. So when I got them in sixth grade, on average, their reading scores were 30 to 35 percentile um, as a class average. And we, I never taught to the test. It was all about embracing what you love and, mm -hmm. and digging deeper with that. We did do some whole class novels um, and they left consistently, I think my lowest percentile rate was 92. Mm -hmm. So in three years, they did it consistently year after year. And um, and I still actually, I had a student who graduated years ago come in and see me today. And um, she had published an author, a, a paper in grad school and said like, I just wanted you to know that I learned those skills back in sixth grade that I could write, that I could express my voice. And um, so I think, you know, there's power to that. And when kids feel power, you know, and I, and I remember every year they would sit down to take that test and I would open it up and I would be like, oh my God, I did not teach any of this. They're going to be terrible. They're going to be, we didn't practice. We didn't do, you know, all of the drills, et cetera. And they would close it and I would say, how was it? And they were like, easy. Because they had, they had learned the skills in their own terrain and they were so passionate about it that they just kept going forward. I just think it's such a tough topic. And Personally, as a teacher, um, I've been more along the lines you're saying, teaching some passion, teaching them to love it, um, doing what you know is right by kids. And, and we call it teaching the reader, not reading. And you got to go with where your kids are taking you. And as hard as it is, I think that we have to there is a balance for sure because we all value our jobs, but I think we have to remember we're here for kids and to do what's best for them. And um, I think it's a personal struggle for a lot of teachers because do we teach to make sure they're doing better on the test or do we teach, as I said, the reader? And um, a lot of times it will go hand in hand, kind of miraculously, right? Um, like you were saying, but but not always. So I wished I had a great answer for that. I think teacher voice is super important for our, our state test. It, it takes some kids three hours to take the reading portion. And when you're 10 years old, nobody should ask you to sit for three hours for anything. And so we, we are asked for feedback, you know, so we give our voice, we say, you know what, if you want kids to do well, you've got to make it kid friendly. So no, that was a great answer. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Away in. 
Yeah, I wanted to just um, commend Angie. Her kids, your kids were very fortunate to have you. <laughs> you know, um, what I did learn in school uh, all those years about um, change models and theories of change is if you want any kind of result, you have to have high fidelity to implementation, three to five years. And you were the, the right person to be with your kids three years, three years of a solid teacher. That that's a, a make or break uh, proposition right there. So that that's a win. That, if they liked you, if they didn't like you, that three years could be a long time. <laughs> <laughs> but they still learned. They still ninety two percent, friend. That is amazing. Yeah. So the, this is what I do know about um, literacy and, and teaching. And what I know about the current landscape of teaching, at least where I am, it is, um, I'm trying to find a nice synonym for micromanaged, but I don't have one. <laughs> and there are lots of people in blazers and suits that push in to check the box to make sure that teachers are doing uh, the checklist the checklist. And as uh, literacy uh, experts, as literacy people, we know that it, it's not always a checklist. Like you can, you can put all that in the, in, the, in the mixing bowl, but it doesn't mean this pound cake at the end. It, it doesn't mean that. So it, it's definitely a, a balance. It's definitely a, a, a balance. I know, and I don't, I feel like that's a, a non-answer because I don't have uh, the one, two, three, but I know that good teachers find a way to teach the good stuff mm -hmm. and it transfers to the standardized test. Equally a good answer. Thanks. TK. Uh, so many good points here. Um, I think Angie's point speaks to the importance of solid teacher you know, student relationships, right? And students don't learn or they don't care about what you're gonna teach unless you care about them. And so let's make sure that we have our best teachers in front of our students. Uh, to Dr. Allen's point of like micromanaging teachers. Uh, yeah, I think of it in terms of over prescribing uh, and like formalizing uh, and standardizing, right? The ways in which learning should be. And, and, and that in a way removes the creativity and autonomy that creative teachers go into the profession for in the first place. And mm -hmm. so when there's this overemphasis on testing, right, the test itself becomes uh, the outcome. Uh, and so I worked at a school where we had kids literally being taken out of their ELA classes to be put in a remedial, you know, standardized testing class, right? Way to kill their joy and love for literacy, reading, writing entirely, right? Um, and, and, and rather than that model, right, what we should be doing is looking at the test as the, 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 the ends, right? Uh, therefore, how can we innovate the means, right? The vehicle in which we'll get there. And if that's analyzing song lyrics over Ibsen, then so be it. How can we get creative teachers and how can we think of fun and innovative ways to get to those skills, right? Uh, instead of focusing on the end product and obsessing over that. And I think in doing so, uh, and going back to our previous points about creating interesting, authentic, engaging choice, right, for our students, uh, you create a learning environment that is inherently joyful, inherently authentic. Uh, and Angie talked about, you know, her students and her um, uh, uh, and her her class. I, I, I teach or used to teach a research based class. Um, and one of the reasons why I loved it was because I wasn't teaching research methods and uh, how to write an academic paper solely. Uh, I was giving students an academic framework to explore their passions uh, and their curiosities. And so students were, 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 were you know, gaining, developing a way to talk about their passions and intellectual curiosities in an academic way. So how can we do the same thing for uh, literacy as well? How can we give them an academic framework to explore literacy skills? Equally good answer. All of you, one way or another, have used the word or have related to it of creativity and thinking and the importance of that. What book do you use uh, or use for those, for the two of you who are now in the classroom, what book do you use that you found was the aha for some of your students in terms of sparking creativity and helping them think um, critically or analytically? I know there's probably more than one book. What's the one where you say, you know what, it's this book 
And it's because I saw student A do so, thus and so, or class B do thus and so. For me, it was learn like a pirate. There's teach like a pirate. There's learn like a pirate. Um, it's not necessarily a literacy book, mm -hmm. but it it's a way to help kids engage in, as TK was saying, in an authentic way with learning. Um, you know, it led us to more simulation type teaching, more creative teaching, because you have to have student engagement. If you teach just to the test, you're not going to have student engagement. And in my opinion, your test scores probably aren't going to go up anyway. Um, so once you get them engaged, they'll just jump in and learn and, and it, it works out great. So okay. teach like a pirate. Okay. Got it. Learn like a pirate. Oh, sorry. Teach like, a pirate. teach like a pirate's pretty good too, but learn like a pirate's really good. Got it. Um, I, I, could sit here for a whole hour and give you book titles that have grabbed you. As, as a librarian, you could pull several, <laughs> yes. <laughs> and so I can't think of just one, but I know, um, like I definitely had my go-tos for my okay. resistant readers. So, you know, way back in the day, The Outsiders was always kind of a, a catch-all for sure. middle school. Um, not so much now, they do like it, but I think it's definitely dated itself. Um, see you like Harry's Freak the Mighty, Dear Martin, the hmm. Ghost series, um, uh, Legend. And then for high school, The Alchemist was always a good, really good conversation starter. Um, yeah. Toni Morrison. Yeah. There, I mean, in my classes, we've always had choice. The, the expectations were high, but how you reached those expectations, you had some choice to. So that way kids could find that book. And um, and I always tell kids, like, I'm pretty bad at most of life. I'm good at like five things. And one of them is putting the right book in your hands. And knowing when the microwave is going to beep. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'm I'm thinking um I'm going back. Man, um hmm. I would start reading books to my kids the first day of school. Yeah. And one of my uh man, ooh, um go to go to favorites was um The Given Tree by Shel Silverstein. Oh, yeah. Very simple book but it, it talks about relationships. Mm -hmm. And so we would tap into relationships and we would talk about what it means to be a good friend and a bad friend. A good friend does uh, share, but a bad friend uses. What's the line? <laughs> what is mm -hmm. that line? So we talked about that. Uh, another one is a, a bad case of stripes about how when you're in a new place, you, you want to give in and how do you be true to, to your authentic self? Uh, how can you be you and not fit in? And it's okay to be you. Um, some of the novels were um, a short one. We would read this before Labor Day was The Hundred Penny Box, which was, was an old, old book about a a little boy and his great aunt who is borderline, borderline uh, has dementia and, and she's from the South and they live in the North and, and their relationship. And a lot of my kids were being raised with the great aunt, the great uncle mm. or the extended family because their, their folks were away. Um, so we talked about those relationships and then we get into um, Bridge to Terabithia, which is about friendship and death. Uh, A Taste of Blackberries, which was also about friendship and death. Um, but not Buddy, um, a, a little kid trying to find his way home. Uh, well, find his family and how he was risky, but very kind of street smart. And every book, um, I just asked a question, you know, well, what would you do? And then I would sit back and let him talk. And the things that they would say would just blow my mind. So I, I really use the book, uh, kind of like TK was saying, uh, loose, loose, probably not 
like you did with the academic framework, but I definitely used it as a framework for thinking and for discourse, because I know the people talking are the ones thinking, that's right, and the ones mm -hmm. learning. And then I, I closed the loop and we wrote about it. <laughs> so that was my, that was my magic formula to open the door, use the book to have a shared experience that we all could have an entry point to have that discourse and then lock it down, lock it down with writing. Uh, I just want to add, I'll make this real quick, right? What Dr. Allen is saying, it's not about the what, it's about the how, right? And I used to have a babysitter who would sit us on her lap and read the Berenstain Bears. And sometimes she would read with so much expression. And sometimes she would make us read from the back in the opposite sentence. And it was hilarious. And I would laugh until mm. I would cry. And it were those experiences that taught me a love and a joy for reading that I still associate with reading out loud to this day. And so what are the ways, uh, what, not just what you're teaching, but how are the ways are you engaging your students in making reading literacy a fun experience? Is there another book? And, I'm gonna, and in fact, uh, Laura, I'm gonna ask you to go ahead and add in a few more books as well. Since others uh, well, I was going to apologize because I misunderstood your question. I thought you were talking about a teaching book that changed our approach, but um, I love what Doritha said about it connecting to them. But I, I guess I really do a lot of books as well that takes them to an outside experience that would be completely um, foreign to them. For example, we read A Long Walk to Water. And it's about this young man and it's during the war, or whatnot. But every um, he's going to school and all these different things happen to him. Well, there's a side by side story happening. And there's this young lady at the same time who every day goes and walks hours and hours just to get fresh water. And so for the full time, you can't understand how these two stories are going to merge. Well, in the end, he ends up coming back and digging a well. Sorry if I blew the book for anybody that's read it. <laughs> Ends up coming back and digging a well so she no longer has to walk for water. And, you know, it provides them an experience of, especially our kids now, because they're so privileged to have so many um, things, but it also shows the altruistic nature. And so even one of our kid uh, teachers took kids and they started uh, uh, walk, they did a walkathon as a class to help raise money to get more of these kinds of wells dug. And so hmm. connecting them that way to that global literacy piece. Thank you. TK, you mentioned being read to, um, I can remember uh, just so thoughts, no, just so stories. Uh, in the fourth grade, learning how the uh, leopard got its spots and and a few other ones. Um, yeah, as you were naming books, I'm saying, oh yeah. And some other ones I obviously needed to brush up on. Well, listen, all great things must come to an end. We're toward the end of our, uh, our time. Thank you so much for sharing your personal and professional stories. Thank you for showing not only your passion, but your intelligence for reading and for literacy and reminding us literacy is more than just reading. It's a cross spectrum. It's a cross time, it's a cross discipline. And also for reminding us that students often interpret our nonverbal and verbal signals about learning based upon how we deal with them. Um, I, was, I had trouble reading all the way through uh, high school, elementary, middle and high school. So I've seen those things happen. And one of the great things about your story is that we can see people who say, I hear where you are and if this is where you are today, got it. Let's see where you can go tomorrow. And when I hear all of you talk, you introduce something that is, let's just say, missing in so much of our conversation, and that's wonder. We've lost wonder. Huh. Stories that make you stop and walk in a different world. We don't have enough of that. So I want to thank you for sharing that. Again, I'm Gerard Robinson. Uh, thank you so much for joining us for another session of In Character, and uh, I'll see you next month. Take care, everyone. <laughs>